I am deeply honored to be here and to be the speaker, <coughs> your opening speaker this morning. Well, I'm not the opening speaker, it's just listed like that. <laughs> We've heard several really good um, comments this morning. Um, and so I'm not here this morning to convince any of you that rural is important. Because the fact that you're here says that you know that rural is important and that you have been working for the benefit of rural uh, for a very long time. It's a pleasure to see this kind of gathering though, because I've been working for the past 15, 16 years with the Rural School and Community Trust. We work with rural schools and communities all over the country uh, with a very simple mission of helping rural schools and communities grow better together. And for 15, 16 years, I have been in assemblies like this where I was the only voice for rural. Um, whether it was uh, the White House you know, gathering or the national organizations around education, there are very few voices out there for rural. And so I am deeply honored that at least in North Carolina, we have a group of folk who not, aren't just rural themselves, but are connecting their voices in ways that can rise above the din that we hear so much around urban education, that kind of divide that um, puts rural at a terrible disadvantage. So as I said before, I'm not here to convince you that rural is important, but I do want to help put rural and rural North Carolina in a broader context. And I know the two issues that Mrs. Clayton mentioned, teachers and technology, are terribly important issues in North Carolina. They're important issues all over rural America. But I also want to put it in a slightly broader context uh, for you so that um, we can kind of see the connections between, because one of the things that challenges us in rural education or any area of advocacy is when we have single <coughs> issues and we aren't able to connect them to the broader issues in order to broaden our base of support and to strengthen our argument for support. So I'm going to help put some of this into a slightly broader context for you. Um, first of all, I also want to talk just very briefly uh, about rural and rural designations. Now, one of the things that we used to say around the Rural Trust is if you feel rural and you think you're rural, you're rural. <laughs> that doesn't work with funding and policy making, right. uh, by the way. And so when we talk about rural, we're talking about uh, NCES designations of schools and districts as rural. And generally, those designations are by the way, if you all want copies, you don't have to copy this. We can get copies of this for you if you need to. Um, but there are three uh, designations uh, that NCES uses to define rural. And this is important because as you're advocating for rural, not so much here in North Carolina because we kind of know what rural North Carolina is, but the reason this is important is that many federal policies that have to do with schools are based on rurality or non-rurality. And how you define rural <coughs> depends uh, a lot, or the support that you do or don't get, depends a lot on how rural is defined at that level. And so the NCES um, locale codes, 41, 42, 43, 41 is for areas that are less than or equal to five miles from an urbanized area or an area that has 40,000, uh, 50,000 people or more, or less than or equal to two and a half miles from an urban center or urban cluster that has 20 to 25,000, I'm sorry, 25 to 50,000 people. Then there's the rule of distance, that's um, designation 42, that's five to two and a half miles from an urbanized area. So all of these things have to do with how close you are to an urbanized area or a population center. Now, one of the things that we have found is that, uh, and I think someone alluded to it here earlier, um, that we've seen declines in the numbers around rural. A lot of that has to do with how NCES and other federal agencies designate schools and districts, districts in particular now. So the districts are designated as rural or non-rural based on 
the majority, we have the plurality of students attend schools. So for example, if you have a county or a district that has most of its kids in a school or in a district that's considered urban, even if there are rural spots in that, right, that district is classified as urban. And so we've seen a lot of the numbers around rural drop because of that kind of classification or reclassification. The number of rural schools, the number of rural students, and uh, so forth. So uh, likewise, you can have a district uh, that is predominantly urban, as I said, but it has rural spots, right? But that district gets classified as urban, right? And so the numbers drop is kind of a numbers uh, game. And so much of the decrease that we've seen in rural student population has to do with that kind of reclassification. Only about 4% of the drop in rural student population is attributed to actual drop, to an actual drop in population. Some of it had to do with uh, districts redoing their addresses, where they had PO boxes before, and then they used physical addresses that turned out to be urban, but they're still in their rural location. So it's important that you remember that, because many of you are not only going to be advocating for rural in North Carolina, you're going to be talking to uh, other, you know, our, our congressional leaders, our, our leaders in Congress as well. And so it's really important that you understand that. But we have about 9 million kids in this country who are in schools that are designated as rural <coughs> right now. That's 18.7% of our public school kids. Um, that's <sighs> but the other telling thing about rural is that a quarter of our kids in public schools are rural kids. Now, here's the thing about averages and percentages. They're really kind of um, uh, misleading because where we have districts, where we have an average, say 25%, we have places that are almost 100% right, rural uh, school districts. And so we just have to be mindful of that. For example, and again, due to the reclassification of, around schools and that kind of thing, in North Dakota, as an example, they have 36.6% rural students. With the reclassification that I just mentioned, they were increased to 37.5% rural. But on the other hand, South Carolina, which initially was uh, had 40.6% of the students designated rural, with the reclassifications, it dropped to 15.9%. Now, when you think about funding and <coughs> policies affecting rural, now those, that other 25% of folks didn't just get up and move to Greenville or Columbia or someplace. They're still where they were. But it's the designation uh, that makes the difference there. 48.2% of our rural kids are eligible for free and reduced lunches. Again, think about what, uh, you know, the whole thing that I was just saying about averages and percentages. That's an average, right, across all of our rural places. Many of our rural places have 80, 90, 99%, right, children in public schools who are eligible for free and reduced lunch, which is the poverty indicator that is used um, in education. So what is that saying to us? We have a population of students in many of our places. Now, rural is not just one size fit all, right? We have uh, what we call amenity kinds of rural places, the destination spots, they're pretty well off and they're doing fine. But for them, and that's what skews the numbers and the percentages. But for the most part, what we're seeing in rural places is that our rural schools are becoming, our rural public schools are becoming more and more children of color who are also poor kids. And that's also what we're seeing, we're seeing that all across the nation. It's also what we're seeing um, in North Carolina. Half of the rural kids in the country live in just 10 states. 
including North Carolina. So we have rural concentrated you know, in the south, southeast, and kind of the southern border, and some places in the northeast. More than a third of the kids in North Carolina attend rural school districts. Now, that's districts, not schools, okay? Rural school districts. And North Carolina is among the highest percentage, has the, among the highest percentage of ELL students in the country. Uh, for a few years, North Carolina's ELL population was growing at the fastest rate of any state in the country. What's ELL? I'm sorry, English language learners. <laughs> sorry about that. So I just want very quickly to run through some, uh, some numbers. The Rural Trust does a biannual report called Why Rural Matters. Its most recent report is being released next week at a congressional hearing um, uh, in D.C. But those data are primarily based on what the schools report, right, to the Department of Ed. And so NCES, the National Center for Education Statistics, compiles uh, these data. We mine that data and do a, a biannual report on the state of rural education state by state. But, um, and one of the, we look at four gauges. One is importance. How important is rural to the success of your state? As Mrs. Clayton was saying earlier, we can't improve in North Carolina if we don't improve rural. We can't be great in North Carolina if we're not great in rural. And so what you see here is that nationally, 28% of our schools are in rural, 28.5. But in North Carolina, 42.4% of our schools are in rural designated places. 39%, almost 40% of our students are in rural schools. North Carolina has the second highest number of rural students in public schools in the state. So rural is very, very, very important to North Carolina, not just in policy making in North Carolina, but at the federal level, because we are the second highest number of, of rural <coughs> students in the country. Percent of state education funds that go to rural districts, North Carolina does pretty well, but then I always say that, you know, the devil is in the details. And so we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Our second gauge has to do with diversity. Uh, and diversity, we looked at the percentage of non-white students in rural places, 25.2% nationally, but 40.5% in North Carolina. And again, some of you know that in your place, that your rural school districts have a heck of a lot more than 40.5%, right? It's again, that whole thing about averages and percentages that I was just talking about. So there's some of our rural districts that are almost totally non-white, the public schools in those districts. Now, I'll get back to that. And again, um, IEPs, students with uh, individual education plans or special ed, we have a fairly high percentage, right at the national average, but a fairly high percentage. And rural students are eligible for free and reduced lunch. We are at the point that now more than half of our students are eligible for free and reduced lunches. And again, in some of our districts, as you know, it's almost 100%. Right, who are eligible. But I want to point out this rural mobility um, piece. Rural mobility is the percentage of students who have relocated during a school year, right? And so 10% of our students overall relocate during the school year. And so they may be going to another school district or another school. But you have to couple that with the fact that so many of our teachers are also mobile and that they're leaving our school districts. We have some school districts that lose up to 30, 35 percent of their teachers each year, right, that turnover. Think about the kind of instability that that creates for kids who also may have unstable situations in their homes and their communities. And so we're dealing with, and a lot of times uh, contributing to, a level of trauma and instability that then we have to deal with in our schools, right? So that uh, mobility piece is, is very, very important. Um, and on this one, I just want to uh, speak briefly about the our investment in education. 
Now again, I know that you're focused largely on technology and teachers, but I do want to help, as I said before, to put this into a broader context, right? So when we look at <coughs> expenditures per pupil in our schools, as you see in North Carolina, um, and the higher ranking here, the closer you are to one, the more urgent you know, this issue is. So you know, North Carolina ranks ninth there. So you see a $5,000 per pupil instructional expenditure. I want you to put that, to think about that in this context. Mm. Okay. So when we say there isn't money to do what needs to be done, all right, we are not telling ourselves the truth. Right? Because if we can spend, now this, this figure, what we spend per year housing an inmate, that doesn't even include the education part, because that's in other departments' budgets for the most part, right? $30,000, right? Now, for North Carolina, I mean, you know, it depends. You know, we can look at other places and say, oh, we're doing pretty well, because in California, they're spending over $60,000 per year to house an inmate. At the same time, we're still building prisons yes. and adding cells and criminalizing the behavior of kids. So don't let anybody tell you we don't have the money to do what needs to be done for education. Right. Don't even listen to that because it's not true. Right? We can redirect. And see, we have to ask ourselves, who benefits? Who benefits from this? Right. And why are we doing this? And then we have to, as I always say to the students that I teach at NC State and Ed Leadership, you gotta peel that onion, right, get to the core, and see how this connects to education. We hear so much about uh, the opportunity gap. We create the opportunity gap. by how we invest our resources, how we, um, just how we, and what we care about, not what we talk about. Now, here's the other thing about this particular piece. Whenever there is uh, fear or actual budget reductions at the state level or the federal level, we never talk about reductions here. We always assume and it does happen that the reductions hit hardest in education. Well, we have to change our expectations, which helps us to change our narrative around these kinds of things. Well, we can cut education, because if the budget is tight, the public expects us to cut education. Well, that's the concept of the power. That cycle has to be broken and it's only going to be broken if we stop expecting that and stop playing into that narrative. We have to change the narrative and change our own expectations in order to see anything change beyond us. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm going to just skip on this. But the one that I want to say, and again, Federal policy makes a lot of difference in what happens here. And so among all of these challenges, I want to look. Many of you have probably had the opportunity to review the proposed uh, federal budget. Right. Somebody goes, <laughs> I'm not going to cherry pick that, but there are some things there that are important because things are being pushed down to the state that the state is not going to be able to afford and the state is going to be pushing things down to the counties that the counties are not going to be able to afford. So what's going to happen? Right. Here are some of the things that are being pushed. The federal, the, you know, and, and you can say, oh, well, that budget is not real, it hasn't passed. 
your heart is revealed in your budget. In your, even your, in your personal budget. When I sit down and do a budget at my house, you know, I have those things that I gotta pay. I gotta pay the note, I gotta pay the light bill, I gotta pay the budget. But the rest of that budget, it reveals what's in my heart and what's important to me. So intent right, is important. So we're looking at a proposed budget that increases, in some areas, our funding. Title one funding, and many of our schools depend on that, $1 billion proposed increase. But with portability, do you know what that means? Portability meaning that the Title I funds, like other funds, like our state funds, follow the students. So if you have an exodus from public schools, from our regular public schools, this will be an even greater drain, exodus of funds <coughs> from public education. So I just want to point that out. So propose, um, <coughs> the proposed budget cuts out $2.4 billion in teacher and school <coughs> training. Now, this is at a time when we're struggling right, with teacher, not just getting teachers, but providing professional development for teachers because there's a perception that it's not effective, it has not been effective, right? And granted, in some instances it may not have been because we have a tendency, and again, it's, it's almost like a manufactured kind of, of, of thing where we, uh, the way funds flow to us, and particularly if you are already economically stressed, you know, it's like we have to go after whatever monies we can go after, and we've got to follow and comply with certain things that often don't even make sense in our local place. And so even when it comes to, say, professional development of teachers, we build that around these, I call them blessed innovations, right, that federal competitive grant money will support. <clears throat> underscore competitive grants. It's one of the things that happened with the previous administration and under Secretary Duncan is that more and more federal money for education went into competitive grants, right? <coughs> competitive grants. Now that puts rural places at a terrible disadvantage, yes. right? One of our organization back in uh, when I3 first came about, we worked with rural school districts around the country to try to help them put together proposals, competitive proposals, because they didn't have the capacity, they didn't have the staff, not that they didn't know how necessarily, but when you have a superintendent who's also driving school bus and teaching and all those kinds of things, doesn't have time to do. He doesn't have time to write a federal grant proposal. And so it puts us at a terrible disadvantage there. So that's something that you have to collect. These other yeah. things, yeah, public. Now I listed this because I think one of the things that has to happen in rural education is that we've got to stop thinking about K-12 as an isolated, you know, kind of entity in education. You know, it's the whole picture and we have to build alliances with people beyond K-12 if we are going to really start to make a difference uh, in, in our education system and our, our community. Impact aid. Some of our districts depend largely on this because that's the money that you get from feds because they have federal <coughs> lands in your area that you don't collect property taxes on. Propose to cut that out. So I'm going to just move very quickly. and tell you what I'm recommending. In addition to your, uh, the, the issues that you're dealing with now, because again, as I said, these issues are all connected. And I call this my 10 point um, rural advocacy agenda. Um, and the first one is to, we have to think forward and strategically. And I think that means really on a regular basis, not having to react to what we hear, but also to be able to be proactive, to be thinking all the time. 
and to be, again, pulling the onion on the things that we hear. Because one of the things that we have seen so much um, is that people court us with the language that appeals to us. And just because they speak our language and use the words that we like to hear doesn't mean they're working in our interest. And so we've got to keep thinking and thinking about what's good and what's best for us and being a real organized and unified voice around the issues that support us. And I mentioned the competitive work. And I'm not even going to talk about the growing your own support for teachers and leaders. You have a panel that's going to talk about that. Um, the broadband piece, uh, I do want to just address very briefly. I know you have a panel about that. But technology access. I see, the word access is also one of those words that's loaded, that, that's deceptive. You know, access, just because I have a Chromebook or whatever, doesn't mean I have access. And it certainly doesn't mean I have equitable access, right? And so one of the things that a lot of uh, communities that we're working with have started to do is to have broadband, they have access on their school buses. They have access in, say, churches that are doing after-school programs and those kinds of things. And I'm going to tell you that one of the things that we're going to have, I shouldn't do that. One of the things <laughs> that we're going to have to do, if we're going to make a difference in education, is partner better with our churches and other community-based organizations. I want to skip down to ensuring, uh, well, number seven, providing equitable funding base. We don't really know what it costs to educate kids where they are, right? You know, we have these formula allocations and those kinds of things, but we really need to dig deeper and look at the circumstances where kids are. What does it cost to educate a kid in Warren County as opposed to a kid in Wake County, right? And particularly urban versus rural. Curriculum re relevance and equity, we have such a tremendous gap in the offerings and what kids can take in their schools. Even in schools where we do have what looks on paper like a really strong curriculum, we have to make sure that all of our kids have access and are engaged in a curriculum that's going to lead to something other than a piece of paper when they march across the stage. So if we are doing CTE, let those kids graduate with industry certification. Mm -hmm. If we're doing technology, let them graduate with technology certification because they may not all go to college. We want those who want to go to go, but they may not all go. Let them graduate knowing how to start a business and fill some of the voids that are in our community. And then the last one, well, the next one, connection for a seamless education. We have a terribly divided education. Uh, we don't have an education system in North Carolina. You know, we've got the pre-K, we've got K-12, we've got the universities, we've got col uh, community college, and now even at the K-12 level, you know, we have the charter, which is another system, and the achievement school district. So we have these schools that we have under-resourced, understaffed, treated badly, and now we're going to put them in a separate, and I'm sure, equal system. <laughs> we have to protect the rights of every child. We don't know what's going to happen to the Federal Office of Civil Rights, but we do know that we have depended on the federal government for years to help do what's right <coughs> by um, poor people, by black people, by people of color. And if that goes away, then we're at, I want to say the mercy of, but we are. What happens at our state level, and we've got to be vigilant, right? Peel the onion, unpack the language, think about where it's leading us, right? Be clear about where it's leading us, even if it isn't what we're being told. We've got to be able to peel that onion and try to have them be clear and not just react to, but be proactive around that. And then lastly, I want to say, so what is it that we have to say about being rural and about making 
North Carolina great, about making America great, is we have to say in the words of Langston Hughes, I too am American. Yes. Mm -hmm.